You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. Welcome to the second story of March 2023, issue 198. I hope you've enjoyed our first story for the month. And if you're a listener who has been here a few times, I hope you've enjoyed the stories preceding that. Once again, thank you for your ongoing support. Please visit patreon.com forward slash Clark's World to see if you could offer some of your support as well. Thank you again to our ongoing subscribers, those who've donated, and those who've been a part of patreon.com forward slash Clark's World. We cannot do this without you. So our second story for the month is titled Pinocchio Photography and is by Angela Liu. Angela Liu is a Chinese-American writer from New York City. She researched mixed reality at Keio University's Graduate School of Media Design in Japan with a focus on new narrative platforms and tangible interfaces for remote communication. She now works in IT consulting and raising a kaiju-loving toddler. Her stories and poetry are published forthcoming in Strange Horizons, The Dark, Nightmare Magazine, Fusion Fragment, Cast of Wonders, among others. So my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, And let me tell you a story. The cadaver drone makes an incision along the inside of each finger. My stomach curls, waiting for the blood. But of course, there's none left. The body has been dead for days, all the blood drained and replaced with a sweet-smelling formaldehyde formula. The drone slots in the nanomachines along each phalangeal segment as the class watches from the double-sided mirror in plastic hair caps and surgical gowns. The mechanical enhancements are designed to last for a little over three hours, the professor explains with her back to the glass. Overhead, a screen broadcasts a close-up of the hyperthin sutures, the robot's precise mechanical hands maneuvering the hairline needle. Sometimes I wonder if there's even a need for humans anymore when it comes to saving people. Out of politeness to the cadaver drone and the client, most aim to finish a photo shoot or a live event within two hours. And it's back to the hospital ice rooms. Two hours. From second life to second death. Shorter than a bad visit to the dentist. Miss Chen? I look up, twenty pairs of expectant eyes on me. The professor is tapping the back of her pen into her notepad. Why do you think we do this? Go through all this trouble? She asks. It's a trick question. The crones ask the same kind all the time. To help people, I smile, ignoring a runny-nosed classmate giggling in the back. The answer feels hollow in my mouth. My father's eyes are bloodshot red when he shambles into the kitchen. What takes 49 days to finish? He asks, opening the fridge and taking out the Tupperware of apple slices my mother left for him before leaving for work. Circumnavigating the globe by high-speed train? I answer, scratching my forehead. Nope. Try again. Crunch. 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 I watch him eat the apple slices, noting the tremor in his hand. We've kept up this morning ritual of bad riddles for over ten years. The tremor's only been there for the past two. He always sits in that same pool of light like a basking turtle, sunlight streaking through the cheap, oil-stained metal shutters. A tiny kitchen is blindingly bright for exactly one hour a day. The rest of the time, we might as well be vampires. I stir my cereal, the O's already softening in the pool of cold milk. You're not even trying he says, but he doesn't have the sharp tone that mom always has when she says the same thing. Like it's another test I failed. At least he's still smiling when he says it. Just tell me then, I'm going to be late for class. I sigh, taking out my phone, the screen flashing with a new message. Hey, hot bitch, can you TA for me for Pinocchio Photography 101? What the fuck is Pinocchio Photography, I take back. LOL, sounds cute, right? Winky face. God, her smileys are the equivalent of disaster warnings. Not at all. Sticking out tongue face. 
they need a pre-med student to help the cadaver drone. You just got to bring the body into the class. Then you can play all the Candy Crush you want while the prof blah, blah, blahs. It takes 49 days for a soul to completely leave a body, my father says louder than necessary. He never likes it when I use my phone at the table. That's what the monk told us when your Wai Kong passed away. What was he doing for the 49 days before he had to go? I ask, quickly typing a response to my friend before putting the phone face down on the table. Just lying around? My father laughs, motioning for me to finish my breakfast. His hand shakes the worse in the morning before his first medicine dose. He pulls his hand behind him when he catches me staring. The dead are busier than you think, he says, trying to smile. Now hurry up, I'll drive you to school. The class is filled with pimply freshmen eager to prove something and seniors looking for an easy elective to fill out their last year as they focus on job interviews and thesis writing. I assume you all know the story of Pinocchio. The professor, a mousy type with a mop of gray hair and thick glasses, asks from the front of the seminar hall. Here, you two will bring the non-living to life, but through photography. Each student is given an SLR designed for post-mortem photography, loaded with a hippocampal film that's probably cost more than my entire tuition. I stand near the door as the class is shown a photo and a profile card of the young woman who had volunteered her body after death. Age, 25. Job, real estate agent. Cause of death, brain cancer. My friend had complained about the woman's mother, how she'd adamantly fought the hospital, refusing to relinquish her daughter's body for postmortem dissections and photography, even though the woman herself had signed the contract several weeks before her death. The professor places the postmortem hollow into the middle of the room and steps back. Hello, my name is Rebecca Hintman. The woman materializes in front of the lecture hall. She has a shoulder-length hair dyed a galaxy of purple and silver. I work at, censored, Inc. in their luxury condos division. I grew up in London, but have spent the past ten years in New York City. I play piano and a little bit of guitar. She held up her fingertips and grinned. Check out these calluses. As she introduces herself, she walks around the lecture hall, raising her arms and lifting her knees in a strange one-woman march. The professor tells the class to pay attention to the way she drags her left leg as she walks or how she scratches her nose whenever searching for the right word. Those little details that add an element of reality. You can request the on-site drone to input these commands. That's usually the difference between a 10 and 9 in customer satisfaction, he points out, pushing up his glasses. When I finally lead the woman into the classroom, the students are blown away by the realism of the cadaver's movements, the flutter of mechanical eyelids, and the tight grip of its smooth hands. Even her hair and the suppleness of her cheeks give no indication of the 30 days she had laid dead in one of the ice rooms. The students raise their SLR cameras, fiddling with the settings as the woman stands mannequin still, awaiting commands. I lay out a chair and several items, a hairbrush, a book about botanical gardens, a few magazines, an empty plastic mug cup. I squeeze her left hand, activating the auto-living mode, and she begins running through a series of tasks with the objects, combing her hair, flipping through the reading materials, fanning a hand over the mug cup, trying to catch a whiff of phantom coffee. How do you get a cadaver to say something? One student asks, thinking he sounds clever. You can adjust the body's facial expressions by using one of the emotion engines or by asking the drone on site to do it for you, the professor says. But you can't talk to the dead. Like in life, the tongue muscle is one of the hardest to control. The class turns to me expectantly, so I press a few buttons on the emotion engine pad and the woman's lips twitch to life, the edge of her Botox plumped mouth rising, her perfectly white teeth implants peeking out the original chipped after her fall, her eyes wrinkling just enough to create the facade of humanity and not tear the hardened tissue. The students, ooh, and raise their cameras.
I've never been able to shake how disconnected the eyes seem from the rest of the body, like the headlights of a crash car still beaming into the dark. Can Rebecca Hintman see the strangers through those new mechanical eyes? If so, what does she think of them taking photos of her dead body with so much glee? What about you? The professor asks, holding up an extra camera. I look around at the empty seats and realize he's talking to me. Um, I cleared my throat. I'm only here to help with the body. Yeah, but why not take some photos since you're here? He turns on the camera and tests the shutter. It gives a satisfying kachi kachi sound. Maybe you can get a new perspective. I don't. He hands me the camera. It's heavier than I expected, almost as much as the silicon babies we used in our intro to pediatrics class. Reality is sometimes more important than what is real, he says, pushing up his glasses. I have no idea what he's talking about, but guess I've got nothing better to do. I lift the camera toward the smiling face, keeping a finger loose over the trigger. <laughs> so the prof got you good, huh? My friend forks strips of oversalted teriyaki pork into her mouth. Didn't know you were into that whole dried-up rat look. I'm not, I frown, snapping open the tab to my soda. The school cafeteria chokes of fried bacon and toasted bread, which is nice because Mom's put down an iron fist on the house menu since Dad's symptoms started getting worse. Every room smells like boiled cabbage and ginseng now. So you've just decided to legit enroll in Pinocchio photography out of your newfound love of art and creepy puppets? They don't actually use puppets. It's just a name. Right. She picks out the broccoli from her cafeteria stir fry and quarantines it into a corner of her plate. I just needed a break. Aren't you worried about residency announcements, final exams? The council of disgruntled and power-drunk old white-coated crones that will now control our lives? Shh, the more you talk about the crones, the more powerful they get. I'm just tired. Me, me too. So don't mind me when I go register for Mermaid Naps 101. God, you're an asshole, I say, taking an aggressive bite out of my caprese panini. Tomato juice and pesto dribble down my chin and hand. You know that's why you love me, she grins. I'm just saying... It's nice to do something that isn't burnout-inducing once in a while. Then maybe you shouldn't have gone into medicine, she says, reaching over to wipe my face with her napkin. For a second, she has the same look as my mother, a classic look from the book of parental guilt. Hmm. The prof got me an internship, I say, batting her hand away. Inside his pants? Shut up, No! at the company that provides the hippocampal film. A neighboring table explodes in laughter. My friend yawns, and I can't tell if she's still listening. At D Life Studio, a small post-mortem photography studio in Brooklyn. Why let death stand in the way of a priceless memory? Want to capture a picture-perfect moment of your newborn with grandma? Mom and dad crying at your wedding. Grandpa and you on graduation day. At D Life Studio, we will bring those unrealized moments to life. With a suite of photography packages to best meet your budget and needs, we offer the latest in post-mortem animatronics, hippocampal film, hollow technology, and a team of dedicated, grief-trained photographers and robot morticians to bring your loved one back to life so that you may create the moments of your dreams. At D-Life Studio, we promise the best memories, even better than real life. My mom puts the pamphlet down and turns on the ceiling fan, stirring the humid air in the old apartment. I stuff the napkins under my bowl to keep them from flying off the table. So you take photos of dead people, my mom says grimly as if talking to the exterminator about a new infestation of ants. Kind of. I take the photos for the pamphlet, I say, spooning soy braised chicken and wood ear mushroom into my bowl. 
Do they pay you extra for that? It's an internship, so of course they paid me the impressive rate of zero dollars per hour. Yeah, I lie, so it doesn't turn into an argument. She lets out a heavy sigh, which can mean many things. I know mom doesn't enjoy talking about my internship. Like her friends, she harbors dreams of freshly minted doctor daughter. One that would write prescription strength meds for her aches and pick out any early signs of cancer like a board certified owl spotting a hiding vole. No wait or copay required. When I'm old, you'll have to take care of me like I took care of you when you were baby, she'd say whenever I missed our weekend dinners. How do you play with a baby? I ask instead, trying to appeal to her love of lecturing, of bestowing knowledge through half insults. I gather the last few rice grains with my chopsticks. You'll know when you have one, she says with a look that conveys the rest of what she wants to say. And you will lose your chance if you do not find a suitable husband soon. I know, but I have a client now who wants a photo of her baby playing with the dead dad. Apparently, he had an accident during a business trip and never made it home to see his newborn daughter. I look at mom to make sure she's still listening. I've got a couple of composition ideas, but I'm not sure what would look the most natural. I'd ask dad, but... You know what the doctor said. I know, I reply, unsuccessfully trying to hide my irritation. Your dad used to tell you stories, mom says. She picked out another fat cube of spice-wrapped tofu out of the jar and eats it with a mouthful of rice porridge, the water dribbling down her chopsticks. Despite a table of dishes and chipped porcelain plates, she doesn't eat much these days. Like, how about he tricked customer care into giving him a year of free internet? No, no, she sighs, and there's that look. Don't you know anything about your father? Another failed test. He taught English and math to the factory workers' kids. He loved the story about the stolen pencils. That was before he got the research grant and we moved to the U.S. He wanted to give you every chance to be better than us. I've heard the rest of this story a million times, but from her, not him, about the poor life they left behind for the less poor but vastly more exhausting life they had here. My dad used to joke about how he bartered years of his life for cash, patting his bad knee and herniated back, as if taking an inventory of sold-out items. I spoon rice and think. I try to picture possible baby photo shoot options, but my head fills with pages of brain charts and bulleted lists of symptoms I've poured over for hours, days, weeks, as if expecting to find a secret cure buried in the seams of information. The awful thing about medicine is how you can know everything about the thing that is killing you and still have no power to stop it. Your father liked taking photos too, Mom says, putting down her bowl and chopsticks. She hesitates, reluctant to share this information. We didn't have any fancy cameras or film back then, but he still loved taking photos of you. Maybe you can find something useful in the basement. They're all still there. The basement is stacked from floor to ceiling with cardboard boxes, old school notes and art projects, baby clothes, still unopened appliances gifted and regifted from relatives, ancient winter clothes. Dad was a professional hoarder, and I'm almost certain I could find any restaurant take-up menu from two decades ago if I tried. I carefully pull out a box marked photos, Jenga-like, and pray the rest of the stack doesn't come crashing down and end me. There are dusty albums with the embarrassingly trite text on the covers like Treasured Memories and Love, and more confusing one-liners like Thank You for Your Kindness, and On a Rainy Day, Still With You. The paper cover albums are flimsy and cheap, the kind you get for free from photo studios when you develop your old film there. I find a few photos where mom looks my age, and it feels like time traveling into a parallel universe where I've got a 1970s perm and a love of cheetah print shirts and fuzzy collared jackets. There are toddler photos of me in frilly pink dresses, dragging frizzy-haired dolls, eating sugary cereal in the kitchen in my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles t-shirt. Baby photos of me sleeping on a corduroy couch, hugging a brown bear, plush doll, 
spitting out green baby food with a look of deep betrayal. I squint at the photos, wanting to see what happened before or after each moment, to catch a glimpse of my mom and dad when they were younger, frazzled first-time parents. But there's nothing but the still image in my hands. I'm overcome with a sense of loss. All these photos were taken before the introduction of hippocampal film. How did people ever think they could capture a memory with just a single, still image? In an older hardcover album, I find a black and white photo of mom and dad holding hands under a massive cherry tree. There aren't many photos of the two of them in semi-romantic poses, but this is one of the few where mom doesn't look overly reluctant. I hear my mom's labored steps down the stairs and the chime of washing machines starting up. I walk over with the photo album for a moment. I watch her load the laundry under the dingy light bulb. She airs out a wrinkled shirt and tosses it into the drum, her hands calloused and covered in decades worth of hot oil burns. My thoughts wander to, would I want a photo of this scene after she died? I can't help it. Thoughts of death permeate everything, a result of the internship. What are you doing over there? She asks, finally noticing me. Going through old photos, do you remember taking this? I ask, showing her the photo of her and dad under the cherry tree. Your father looks tired like always, Mom says, taking a crumpled sock from the laundry basket and turning it inside out. Do you remember where this was taken? I ask. She pulls out her reading glasses from her vest pocket and gives the photo a second look. It's the small patch of cherry trees near the train station in my hometown. It's where I used to wait for my father when he came home from his trips to Taiwan. Her finger tapped the back of the album as if to knock the memory loose. It's also where I used to wait for your father when he came to visit, back when we were dating. She laughs, taking her glasses off and handing me back the album. I always told your dad we could go back someday and maybe the trees would still be there. Maybe we could go as a family. Everything else changed so quickly. Sprawling designer, shopping malls, replacing counterfeit clothes markets. haagen and KFCs replacing the small noodle stands and candy shops. But I thought at least the trees might be still there, even if everything else I remembered was gone. She loads the detergent into the small drawer of the washing machine, fiddling with the settings. We could still go, I say, mentally calculating the cost of plane fare and the days I'd need to take off from school and work. My mom won't meet my eyes, recapping the detergent slower than necessary. She knows better than I do why we won't. Why we can't. Shouldn't you be studying for your final exams, she says, almost like an act of mercy. The D-Life studio owner looks like a mix between Yoko Ono and the corpse host from Tales from the Crypt. She makes green tea with a bamboo whisk for each customer and plays a lambskin ukulele when the babies start crying. Ah, mommy, you look like shit. She greets me like a drunk aunt smoothing out my bed hair. Mrs. Shelley's already waiting in the studio. Cadaver drones should be arriving in a few minutes. Try to calm her down. What should I do? I ask as she shoves a bag of camera equipment into my chest. Talk about yourself. Play up your indecisiveness between med school and the exciting world of death photography. Nothing brings a middle-aged person more joy and relief than a young person with no direction in life. Hey, I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. Go on. She practically shoves me into the studio. Is it like working in a theater? My father asked when I visited him at the hospital to tell him about my new internship. Uh, Not really. I answered evasively, trying not to picture my boss in the plastic Pikachu mask she sometimes wore to get a smile out of the children that usually just terrified. My father ate an apple slice from the Tupperware my mom had brought. He'd read through the pamphlet for D-Life with more curiosity than I expected. I was thankful my mom was arguing with the nurse in the hall about his food regiment so that she couldn't heap on her own judgments about my new internship. 
Which one of them is, is dead? He asked, his eye settling on a series of test photos I'd taken of a couple with a baby. Which do you think? I asked. He scratched the tip of his nose with his thumb, studying the three people. It had gotten harder to read his expressions after he started losing control of facial muscles. On the good days, he would smile and laugh and pretend to be shocked when Mother asked why he wasn't eating the awful hospital food. On the bad days, his mouth would tighten into a straight, quivering line, and he would just stare at the muted television our entire visit. The baby, he decided, glancing up at me and then back at the photo. It looks too clean and well-behaved to be real. Nope, I smirked. Try again. My father chuckled, leaning back into the raised bed, slowly lowering his hands into his lap, the half-eaten apple slices pinched tightly between his thumb and index finger. Tell me then, he said, still smiling, but I knew he was getting tired. He was always tired now. For a moment, I tried to picture a younger version of him, the photos from the basement slotting over a blurry memory. He was sitting in the kitchen of our old house, holding a small book I'd made at school, a poorly drawn mess with the misspelled title, My Family, written with crayon on the cover. The teacher had given us kid-sized cameras to take photos of our family, and I'd filled my book with cheap crinkled printouts of my parents chatting on the couch, cooking, chasing rats out the door, sleeping open-mouthed on the bus smiling awkwardly in front of the fake poinsettias on displays outside the dollar shop after Thanksgiving. My father's hair was still black, without the cheap hair dye, the quiver gone from his lips and his hands. Come on, read it to me, he insisted, flipping through the book with wide eyes. My little genius. It's the father, I said, suddenly struggling to breathe. He passed away during some business trip before the baby was born? My father studied the photo underneath his hands, his face wrinkling up as if unsure what to think. Was that disgust? Confusion? Did you take this photo? He asked. No, I lied, not sure why. I could hear my mother wrapping up her stalemate with the nurse in the hall. I look really happy he said finally, taking another bite of his apple slice. Mrs. Shelley asks if she can smoke a cigarette while we wait. Sorry, the smoke damages the equipment and walls, I answer, watching the condensation drip down her iced coffee. The woman snorts, pressing two fingers to her lips as if scissoring an invisible cigarette. Yeah, model used to take a lot of photos too before he realized pretty pictures of oceans and hummingbirds don't pay the mortgage. She lowers her hand and curses. Sorry, no offense. I'm taken. My husband was cheating on me with one of his clients, she says, stirring her iced coffee with her straw. I don't say anything and she laughs, the kind of laugh old people have when you ask them if they're happy, as if the question itself is an insult. I didn't find out until after he died, she continues. The woman called his phone, demanding to know why he hadn't showed up to the hotel. She scoffs, waving the air in front of her as if to dispel an unpleasant smell. Is it bad that I wasn't even upset about it? I was just pissed he'd left me alone to fend for myself with that. She gestures at the baby sleeping soundly in the bassinet by the window. <sighs> May I ask... Why you've ordered a photo shoot with your late husband, then? I ask, not sure if I'm allowed to speak his name. Because his insurance paid for it? She looks like she's waiting for me to laugh, so I let out a pained chuckle. I can already feel the studio owner's death glare at my abysmal acting. Just kidding. I can hate his guts, but a child shouldn't hate their father. Fucks you up, I think. She sucks on her straw, thinking, wondering if you weren't good enough, wondering why you weren't loved. Truth is, shitty people can still love their kids. Of course, that doesn't make them any less shitty, but to a kid. What do you think is more important, knowing your dad was a deadbeat or believing he loved you? 
Reality is sometimes more important than what's real. The baby cries out in her bassinet, milk stains through the woman's shirt, the body reacting even before the brain can remember. The residency announcements come and go like a summer flash storm. The halls of the school are miasmic with the smell of alcohol and tears. I barely pass my final exams, but I find my student number on the list of survivors elected for the pearly gates of medical school. I imagine my mother prancing and toasting her friends across the field of immigrant dreams. My professor at Pinocchio Photography gives me a brand new book called The Anatomy of Tears, a guidebook for your first year of medical school. As a congratulatory gift or a warning, I'm not sure. When I call my mom to tell her, she doesn't pick up. I go with my friends to karaoke and all you can eat barbecue to celebrate. I drink and eat too much and forget the upcoming interviews I have with the council of disgruntled and power-drunk old white-coated crones. All the school visits and thank you letters I will need to write. I momentarily think of my dad and wonder if he got drunk with his friends back in China, too, when he first found out he was coming to the U.S. How had he felt? Did he ever regret his decision? He probably doesn't remember any of it anymore anyway. For a moment, guilt floods me like the smell of old albums in the basement. When I go to the bathroom to empty my stomach of too much soju, I see my mom's message. Ame, your father passed away this morning. I don't call back. I delete the message immediately, as if I could erase the memory of the words with it. I go to my internship at D-Life the next day, feeling like a ghost. We've got a client whose mom passed away from a car accident a few days before graduation. So I help set up the holds for the pseudo-ceremony and coach the girl on how to stand to best hide the incomplete work on her mom's legs. The death was unexpected. The order to last minute. Graduation season is one of the busiest times for the cadaver drones. I give the girl a pack of extra soft tissues when she starts to cry. I run the test shots. There's relief in work. The owner doesn't knock on the bathroom door when I don't come out for an hour after the photo shoot. I listen to the dripping in the cistern, as if I could lose myself in that sound. I try to remember the last time I talked to my dad, really talked to him. But I can only recall the way he hid his hands, the words too far away to grab a hold of. I think of all the questions I will never be able to ask, all the memories I will never know. How do you make sense of the present when there are so many empty spaces in the past? When I get back to my desk, eyes swollen, there's a slice of chocolate cake and a note that says, Life sucks ass. Have cake. And then get the shit you gotta get done, done. I eat the cake and call my mother back. How much is a basic package? My mom asks as I wash the dishes. She frowns as I squirt too much detergent into the sponge. A company sells a five-photo package, which includes up to two living family members in the photos and up to two hollow scenes. My mom's frown deepens. Basic, I say. No hollow or anything fancy. Does one of your friends want to do a photo shoot or something? Maybe able to use my employee discount if they're doing it before I start med school. Your father. Mom lowers her voice as if suddenly the whole building is pressing their ears to the wall. His idea, not mine. Your father wanted you to do it. I turn off the faucet, my hands still slippery with soap suds. we just held my father's funeral two weeks earlier. His body was still in the ice room, and I'd been too afraid to ask my mother why we had not buried him yet. I don't know. Maybe I can ask someone else at the company to... No. He asked for you. Said you do it. My mom stands up and takes a pill case from the shelf, those tiny square chambers filled with different color pills that help keep her own body from killing her. She used to joke with my father about how he'd outlive her by decades, shaking her pill box like death's bell. I know it's a stupid idea, she says, reading my hesitation. But a dead man's final wish is still a wish. Your father took care of you when you were a baby. And now it's your turn. I watch my father's postmortem hollow, alone in my old bedroom. 
Hello, my name is Henry Y. Chen, he says, standing in the middle of the bedroom. He's wearing his usual navy sweatshirt and a knit cap since he became overly sensitive to the cold by the end. I work at Censored Labs as a technician. I grew up in Shushou as the fourth son of a college professor and a housewife, but have spent the past 30 years in New York City. I am married with one daughter, age 23. She works at Censored as a photographer. He smiles into the camera, eyes wrinkling. Sir, please walk around the room so the drone will better understand how your body moves, someone off camera instructs. Oh, sorry. My father stands up and saunters around the room the way he often did after eating dinner to help with digestion. I fight the urge to step in front of the hollow, as if I could somehow enter a tiny pocket of time where he still exists. Can you please tell us why you've requested a postmortem photography session with D-Life Studio? My father's face becomes very serious, eyes narrowing. This is the final test for my daughter, to see if she's worthy of being part of the Chen family. His lips twitch, and he bursts out laughing. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding, if you're watching this, Mamie. I hope that you're laughing with me. You're always the best part of our family, no question. Now, the reason I'm requesting this session is because I still have unfinished work. He taps his head the way he used to do with his bad knees, his frustration palpable through the screen. You always think there's more time until you're facing the end. It's funny how quickly your own body turns on you. My wife tells me I'm stupid all the time, that I can't remember anything anymore. She's not wrong, but there's still so much I have to do. Promises I made a long time ago that I still want to keep. So I wanted to record this while I still remembered while I still felt like myself. I thought I could ask my daughter to help me. He coughs, covering his mouth with a hand so thin, the veins so watery and visible over the brittle bones, that it's almost unrecognizable. I can barely remember the last few months in and out of the hospital between the hours cramming in the library, post-production, after the photo shoots at D-Life Studio, and translating for my mother as we spoke to my father's doctors. He'd play games on his phone and tell my mother and me that we didn't need to stay. Go home and eat something good. The hospital food is horrible, he'd say with an apologetic smile. Those were the good days when he remembered who we were. The other days he'd scream at my mother, throwing his tea at her, accusing the nurses of trying to poison him. The week before his death, he asked me if I was a friend of his daughter if she was doing well at the hospital she worked at, that he hoped she wasn't working too hard, that he was so proud. He looked so happy that I didn't want to tell him the truth. Toward the end, he slipped into a coma and never returned, my mother cutting apple slices in his room, even though there was no one to eat them. My hand reaches for the hollow, my father rendered into a zero-mass combination of sound and Color particles, so close yet impossibly far. Why do we keep reaching, knowing we will never be able to cross that distance? I put the camera equipment on the floor and wait for my mom to finish drinking her tea. From the window of the D-Life studio, I watch a woman feed breadcrumbs to a flock of pigeons. Do you have any ideas for what kind of photo you wanted? I ask sheepishly, still feeling like a kid when talking to my parents. For a moment, my mother looks embarrassed too, like someone caught writing down their fantasies into their diary, but she quickly snaps back to her usual barrage of insults. You know I don't like this kind of thing. I hate photos, she frowns. My father never listened to anything I said. It's the whole reason we're even here. That idiot was fighting me even until the last day. This is the only way she knows how to deal with grief, drowning it in anger before it could drown her. I think of my father how he often sat quietly as she yelled at him, how he was like a meditating stone, waiting for her to calm down so they could get into the real crux of a problem, how he knew she sometimes needed him to bring her back. I open my equipment bag and pull out the hollow I'd borrowed from a co-worker. 
It's an older one, but the lower resolution will give the shoot a nice retro feel that would match the other photos in my parents' albums. Just imperfect enough to feel more real. What about a photo under the cherry blossoms? I ask, turning on the hollow. The room transforms into a forest of pink flowers, petals falling, grass at our feet. My mom's face is unreadable, guarded. She opens her palm to catch one of the falling petals and then frowns as it disappears. <sighs> what are we old people going to do looking at fake flowers? He said he wanted to keep his promise, I answer. My father is sitting in his old chair in front of the television, silent like he'd often been. He'd always massage his knees and neck, a pained look on his face until he noticed me come into the room. I sometimes think of how facial expressions exist for the sole purpose of letting others know how we feel. Hundreds of muscles sending a signal, hoping someone understands, even when we can't come up with the right words. The cadaver drone instructs him to stand and walks him to the center of the hollow, his legs still shaky. The work is good but not perfect, which adds an element of reality. He's dressed in his old navy sweatshirt and a new pair of sneakers. He lifts one hand, virtual pink petals dropping onto his head. He reaches for my mom. I don't know if the drone had commanded him to move like that, but it doesn't matter. Real matters less than what the eye thinks it sees. My mom takes his hand, like she had so many times before, to steady his tremor, to remind him she was still there. She nods once, then twice, saying nothing a slight quiver in her lip. I wonder if she's thinking the same thing I am when looking into his glass eyes. Will I be okay on my own? Photography and medicine, they're not so different. They're both in the business of prolonging a life, of alchemizing borrowed time. Can he see us? It takes 49 days before the soul leaves the body. I want to believe that. I lock the camera on the tripod and set the timer. As the camera beeps, I run over and join them. Just a family. Under the flowers. What are your thoughts on the story? Thank you for joining us yet again. You can find us over on our social medias and over at the About Us page where all of our contact information is listed. We have a ton more stories left for you for the month of March. I do hope you come back and listen. And until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very fond and hopefully very temporary farewell. <laughs>